How y'all living, my fellow chooms and hair loss witchers? Here's to hoping you're all still fighting the good fight against the slaphead curse. So recently, I've been on a bit of a binge when it comes to investigating some future hair loss treatments that might someday take the place of the best treatments we have now, meaning finasteride and minoxidil. As great as finasteride and minoxidil are, and as much as I believe they will halt and reverse hair loss in virtually everybody who uses them, I don't believe that we've reached the absolute pinnacle when it comes to hair loss treatments there is always going to be room for improvement. There are many promising new treatments on the horizon, including ones that work through familiar mechanisms by blocking DHT, such as pyrolutamide and clascoterone, but some of the most interesting new treatments involve what's called the WNT, or Wnt pathway. I already made videos on two of these future treatments, um, which are called SM04554, as well as KY19382, that both work by stimulating the Wnt pathway, and both these drugs look promising for promoting hair growth in people with with androgenic alopecia, regardless of whether or not they are good responders to finasteride. Today, I'd like to revisit the Wnt pathway route of tackling hair loss by talking about another drug that affects the Wnt pathway, albeit by a different mechanism from those other two drugs I already covered. This particular drug is called Way 316606. It was originally developed for treating osteoporosis, but as it turns out, it may grow hair as well. But before getting into how this drug works, we need to take a closer look at what the Wnt pathway pathway is and how it works. Also, there is some interesting data on the relationship between the Wnt pathway and androgens in the balding and non-balding scalp that we will want to take a look at as well. So let's get ready to go balls deep into the Wnt pathway and how this new category of hair loss treatments may very well be the future for fighting hair loss. So the Wnt signaling pathway is a very ancient pathway found in pretty much all animals, from humans to fruit flies. So it is obviously a very important biological system. It is used in fetal development to switch on and off the the DNA in fetal cells and basically tells these fetal stem cells whether to become bone or skin or liver or brain or whatever tissue the Wnt pathway wants it to be. Bottom line though is that the Wnt pathway is the first step or base clay in cellular development so research into the Wnt pathway has the potential to treat many physiological problems including diseases like cancer. It has lots of potential beyond just hair loss though but the fact of the matter is is that it can be used to treat hair loss as well and that's a very welcome bonus. So even even though the Wnt pathway is seen as being mostly useful during fetal development, the fact is, is that it's also important in adults too, and that is because it regulates cell renewal and regeneration. We know that hair follicles, like every other tissue in our body, constantly regenerate throughout our lives, and they do this by going through the hair cycle, which consists of an antigen growth phase that lasts years, as well as a brief catagen phase where the follicle basically dies, and also a telogen resting phase that lasts about three months. And this is followed by a regeneration of the hair follicle with shed of the old hairs and a restart of the antigen growth phase with new hairs and new hair follicles. Everyone's hair follicles will go through these cycles regardless of whether or not they have androgenic alopecia, which is why everybody will periodically experience things like hair shedding, but it is the presence of androgens like DHT which negatively influence this growth cycle by shortening the growth phase and prolonging the resting phase. There is a lot of evidence that the Wnt pathway is critical for this renewal of the hair cycle and also is important for continued growth of hair during the angin phase, hence why much recent research into the realm of hair loss prevention centers on drugs that specifically target the Wnt pathway. Drugs that stimulate the Wnt pathway encourage the development of hair follicles and lengthen the angin phase. So even though Wnt pathway drugs do not inhibit DHT, they still have the same end result as inhibiting DHT, and we'll talk more in depth about the role androgens play on the Wnt pathway later on, but for now, I've linked several articles below that go into more detail on the experiments that prove the association between Wnt pathway and hair growth. But to summarize all that data, the simple conclusion is that the Wnt pathway is critical for hair growth. So, Obviously, something that regulates how cells develop is going to be very complicated, but let's simplify this a little bit and get a general idea of how the Wnt pathway works. First of all, there is more than one Wnt pathway, but the one we are most interested in is the one that is called the canonical pathway because that is the Wnt pathway which regulates hair growth. This canonical pathway revolves around a protein that is called beta-catenin. So, to explain what beta-catenin is, it's basically like a key that can lock DNA in the cell nucleus and cause the creation of new proteins, aka protein synthesis. These proteins might be proteins that cause hair growth or that can regenerate a hair follicle that has been miniaturized. However, as useful as beta-catenin is, 
as beta catenin is, it normally is not just floating around the cell because unfortunately, as soon as it is formed, it is attacked by this big monstrous glob of proteins called the destruction complex that you can see here. And even though destruction complex sounds like a pretty badass name, it's definitely not a good thing. So despite the name, the destruction complex actually doesn't destroy beta catenin. Instead, it targets it for destruction by tar attaching a substance called ubiquitin to the beta catenin, which is exactly the same process that the new drug GT20029 uses to tag angin receptors for deletion that I described in more detail in my recent video on that subject, which I'll go ahead and link below in case you haven't seen it yet. So this beta catenin is tagged with the mark of the beast and is basically just a sitting duck for the cell's garbage collector, which is called proteasome. So normally because of this, the beta catenin doesn't survive in the cell and the cell's DNA, it remains locked up and inactive as you can see here. The way the Wnt pathway comes to the rescue, though, is by providing a mechanism for the beta catenin to effectively elude the cell's garbage collectors and get to the nucleus of the cell and unlock the DNA. The Wnt pathway is triggered by, you guessed it, Wnt. WNT. Wnt is the name of a group of proteins that are secreted by the cells and are the triggers for the Wnt pathway. So these Wnt proteins bind with a receptor on the cell membrane, which is actually two receptors. The first one is called the frizzled receptor, and the other one is called the LRP receptor. This inactivates the protein GSD3 beta, which is a part of the big monster destruction complex. So the destruction complexes just fall apart completely, so you can kind of think of the destruction complex as a striga, and the wind pathway is a witcher silver sword. This process allows the beta catenin to escape getting tagged for deletion, so it can then go to the nucleus and unlock the DNA and cause protein synthesis. Synthesis. All this new protein that is synthesized is then used to regrow new hair. So fantastic! Now I know this all sounds pretty complicated, and if we really were to go in depth with this, we'd find it's actually even a lot more complicated than what I just described, but the general idea is that the Wnt pathway helps promote hair growth, and Wnt stimulator drugs can promote the Wnt pathway even without influencing androgens, which makes Wnt stimulators a potential treatment that could be used alongside finasteride, or possibly even replace it altogether, although more human trials are needed to confirm this. So you may be asking yourself right now, but Kevin, you always said that that androgens were what caused androgenic alopecia, didn't you? So yes, I have said that, and that's because it is true. It is called androgenic alopecia because the progression of it is dependent on androgens, namely DHT. As it turns out though, this is not contradictory at all because androgens interact with the Wnt pathway. In an interesting study, which I'll link below from 2020, that looked at the effects of DHT on the wind pathway in both mice and human hair follicles, the researchers treated cultured human hair follicles with different concentrations of DHT, and they measured hair shaft elongation, the proliferation of hair matrix cells, and the levels of beta-catenin. I discussed this study in my video on SM04554, but I think the results are so interesting that they bear repeating here. Anyways the researchers found that the effects of DHT were remarkably dose-dependent. At lower levels of DHT, concentrations of around 10 to the minus 7th, there was greater hair shaft elongation and hair cell proliferation compared to the control group. In the case of 10-fold higher DHT concentrations, namely 10 to the minus 6, there was worse hair shaft prolongation and decreased cell proliferation compared to control. The effect correlated with beta-catenin levels in the cell's nucleus as seen here. The nuclear beta-catenin levels were very much higher than control at 10 to the minus 7th DHT, and the beta-catenin levels were much lower than controls at 10 to the minus 6th DHT as seen here. All this implies that low levels of DHT actually stimulate the wind pathway while higher levels inhibit it. This is important because we know that the levels of DHT are higher in the balding areas of the scalp compared with the non-balding areas in people with androgenic alopecia. And the DHT levels are also higher in these areas of scalp in androgenic alopecia compared with the same areas in subjects without androgenic alopecia. These areas of balding scalp with higher DHT levels also have higher 5-AR activity 
activity in more angin receptors, all pointing to a genetic abnormality of angin processing underlying what is aptly named androgenic alopecia. So the bottom line is that one of the reasons why DHT destroys hair follicles is because at high levels it inhibits the Wnt pathway. It's important to note though that this is not the only reason why DHT destroys your hair follicles. DHT also reduces growth factors like IGF-1 while promoting negative growth factors like TGF-beta. So even though having a drug that stimulates the wind pathway is very promising, we shouldn't assume this will be a fully blown, uh, we shouldn't assume this will be a full blown replacement for a 5A reductase inhibitor drug like finasteride or dutasteride, at least not until we have more clinical trials based on humans. However, even if wind stimulator drugs are not full blown replacements for finasteride, at the very worst, it still sounds like they could be very strong adjunct treatments that could be used alongside drugs like finasteride and make a hair growth stack much more effective than just finasteride and minoxidil, for instance. But it may not just be the level of the trash hormone DHT that is important for its effects on the Wnt pathway. An earlier study published in 2009 from Japan also looked at interactions between androgens and the Wnt pathway. The researchers in this study looked at cultured human dermal papilla cells from men with and without androgenic alopecia. They basically added Wnt with or without DHT to the cultured cells and looked at cell proliferation and beta-catenin levels. One thing they found was that the number of angin receptors was higher in the frontal areas of the scalp of the males with androgenic alopecia versus the occipital regions of the scalp of the males without androgenic alopecia. So yeah, that's why people lose hair in a pattern like that typically. It isn't because of scalp tension like so many hairline fraud souls like to claim. But anyways, these results also go along with other studies that show increased angin receptors in the balding scalps of persons who have androgenic alopecia. The data from the study, though, suggests that angin receptors deactivate beta-catenin, and thus the increased angin receptors in balding scalps may inhibit the Wnt pathway by inhibiting the function of beta-catenin, which of course is a bad thing since we need beta-catenin for hair growth. The investigators also found some differences in the response of the Wnt pathway to DHT in balding versus non-balding scalps, with more suppression of the wind pathway from DHT in bald scalps than in non-balding scalps, which further establishes the fact that androgenic alopecia is a genetic trait that not everybody has. So let's summarize these studies so far. It looks like higher levels of DHT and more angin receptors in balding scalps may inhibit the wind pathway and thus inhibit hair growth. But also, the wind pathway in balding scalps may be more sensitive to DHT than in non-balding scalps, which means that the reason people with androgenic alopecia go bald is because of both increased levels of DHT on the scalp as well as, as, well as an increased genetic sensitivity to DHT. Clearly, more research needs to be done in regards to Wnt pathway stimulators, but it is obvious that the Wnt pathway is inhibited in androgenic alopecia, and drugs that can stimulate the Wnt pathway, like SM04554 and KY19382, might reverse the hair loss in androgenic alopecia sufferers. And like I said, I presented the data on those two drugs in previous videos, which will be linked below in case you haven't seen them. So you may be asking yourself, what in the hell is the point of yet another Wnt pathway drug like Way 316606 when we already have several other treatments that are undergoing clinical trials as we speak. Well, I thought the same thing at first, but upon doing further investigation, I came to the conclusion that even though Way 316606 is a wind stimulator, it isn't quite the same as the other two wind stimulators that I did videos on, and in fact, it may even be better than those two. There was a study published in 2018 with the title, quote, Identifying Novel Strategies for Treating Hair Loss Disorders. Cyclosporine A suppresses the Wnt inhibitor SFRP1 in the dermal papilla of human scalp hair follicles, unquote. Now, before we get into the study, though, we have to examine one more nook and cranny of the Wnt pathway. You see, outside of the cells, there are proteins floating around called secreted frizzled related proteins, or SFRPs. These SFRPs bind with Wnt proteins before the Wnt protein even gets to the cells and thus inhibit the Wnt pathway, which obviously results in hair loss, so it's not a good thing. But these SFRPs don't act inside the cells, they just prevent the Wnt from even getting into the cells to begin with. So they regulate the Wnt pathway indirectly by preventing Wnt from even interacting with the cell at all. But if you can find a way to block or just outright stop making these SFRPs, you will end up with more Wnt floating around 
that can stimulate the wind pathway. So by doing this, it turns out you can stimulate the wind pathway by inhibiting these SFRP proteins. So you can probably see to where I'm getting with this here with this whole way 316606 treatment. But to go back to the research, there is a drug called cyclosporine, which inhibits these SFRPs, but cyclosporine is an immune system suppressor. It is used in patients with organ transplants to prevent rejection of the transplants, but it also has a lot of really nasty side effects. And I'm talking about real side effects, not the type of side effects people make up and imagine like you see on the Propecia Help forums. If you live in the USA or New Zealand, you're probably exposed to a lot of drug commercials. When you hear drug commercials that say things like, don't take this drug if you are immunosuppressed, they are talking about people who are taking cyclosporine. So while cyclosporine can cause hair growth, it is too dangerous to use because of its side effects. So in that sense, it is kind of similar to something like oral minoxidil, except it's much more dangerous because even though oral minoxidil is dangerous in the sense because it raises your risk of cardiovascular side effects, cyclosporine outright eradicates your immune system so that even something like a common cold could kill you. Just watch though, I bet after this video you're going to see the hair loss forums and subreddits just light up with posts from people asking how to get this drug, and you know, that's fine, but do not ask me about it, okay? Thank you. Still, this is really a shame that cyclosporine is so dangerous because the way cyclosporine stimulates the wind pathway doesn't involve tinkering with the wind pathway inside the cells like SM04554 and KY19382 do. So why does that matter, you may ask? Well, it matters because doing things to the wind pathway inside the cells can be dangerous. For example, out of control wind pathways have been associated with cancer. However, way 316606, which I think we'll just call way from now on, also blocks the SFRPs and stimulates the wind pathway like cyclosporine does, but it doesn't have the effects on the immune system, so we'd be able to take it and not have to live like a quarian from Mass Effect. Whey was developed to treat osteoporosis since it uses the wind pathway to stimulate bone growth, but since it blocks SFRPs, it could help hair growth as well. So. This study looked at both cyclosporine and whey to see their effects on hair follicles. Like the other studies we've mentioned so far, these researchers are using cultured human hair follicles in this study, and you can see here that cyclosporine, labeled here as CSA, decreased the SFRPs in these graphs. Cyclosporine also increased the percentage of hair follicles in the antigen growth phase, but this was reversed when they added more SFRPs to the follicles, which further demonstrates the fact that SFRPs have a strong role in preventing hair growth. So the researchers were able to demonstrate that cyclosporine promotes hair growth by eliminating SFRPs, while whey just binds with the SFRPs and inactivates them and thus prevents the SFRPs from interacting with the Wnt proteins. This allows the Wnt proteins to reach the cells and activate the Wnt pathway. When the researchers looked at the effects of whey on human hair follicles, there was definite hair growth, as well as an increase in the percentage of hairs in the antigen phase. Since whey has fewer effects, uh, side effects than cyclosporine, obviously, and since it works on the wind pathway indirectly, it might end up being very safe and effective in treating all types of hair loss, but particularly hair loss caused by androgenic alopecia. So I think these wind pathway drugs all have tremendous promise and might be the wave of the future for hair loss treatments. Way 316606, or way in particular though, might be better than the other wind pathway drugs due to its mechanism of action. Way only acts outside cells and just affects the amount of wind protein reaching the cells, while the other wind pathway drugs are acting inside the cells and maybe they have more potential to cause havoc since we know that messing up the wind pathway inside the cells is one of the things that can cause cells to go cancerous. But this is all pretty preliminary and there are a lot of steps that need to be taken before a drug like this is ready for human use. The big question though, that I'm sure a lot of people would like to know though, is can wind pathway stimulating drugs like Way 316606 replace finasteride since we know DHT inhibits the wind pathway? Well, I'm going to say no, I don't think they can replace finasteride because even though the suppression of the wind pathway is one of the mechanisms behind how DHT destroys hair follicles, it is just one of many. That being said though, I absolutely do think that these wind pathway drugs can help and I very much look forward to seeing how more research is done to these drugs as well as seeing how they do in actual human clinical trials. If the human clinical trials prove that the treatments are safe and effective, then I hope for a prompt commercial release. Until then, keep fighting the good fight, my hair loss witchers, and I'll see you again soon. Take care.